Our second panel for the day is attractiveness of the language industry for in-house and freelance translators. Our panel chair is Heike Leinhäuser, president of the European Union Association of Translation Companies. Heike has been active as in-house translator, freelancer and business owner. Please, you have one hour. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to the conference organizers. I think it's really very generous to give the floor to the industry today. So, and also maybe give, I hope, so very useful information, maybe also for young professionals. And um, firstly, a warm welcome to my panelists, Terry White, Marta Ragao, Alessandro Catalan, and Gökhan Fierat. I will introduce you shortly later on. And um, yeah, I'm really delighted to, to be sharing a panel with, um, yeah, which is such esteemed and, and so important industry players. And I think this is, um, yeah, we will be very focused on, on job profiles and jobs in the translation industry in this panel. So it is important to really have different stakeholders of the industry on the panel. Yeah. Actually, fun fact, we do very, very different jobs, all of us, but we are all educated translators. Um, before we start, I would like to give you just a look at the translation industry. In Europe, we are the, the we, we have the largest part in, in the global translation industry overall. So, the, the turnover in Europe, which is generated in Europe, is um, almost half of the, of the, of the global translation um, and language services volume. Um, so, which means that we have a turnover of approximately 30 billion euros um, at the moment. And I think the, the global industry has around 60 billion US dollars and aiming at 100 within the next years. So the industry has been constantly growing and still is, but of course we are facing a lot of challenges and we always had. So there was always change in the industry and uh, especially now it has been shaped in the last years by machine translation, neural machine translation, speech to text in audio visual services, then many, many um, AI applications popping up now, open AI. So it's really a lot going on and I think we have uncertainties in the market. There is um, a sentiment which might not be so good, but nevertheless, the industry is still growing. So this means that we are a major employer. Um, so it's not just talking about turnover, words, and whatever we do uh, all day long, but it's all about jobs and what are the different profiles in the translation and yeah, language service industry. So I'd like, I'd like to start with Terry. Terry White um, is a... Is, a freelance translator has been for more than almost 30 years. Um, a couple of years ago, you did even an MA in legal translation, so at quite a late state, I would say. <laughs> um, you always deliberately choose to, um, yeah, to be a freelance translator, to be self-employed, and it would be great if you could tell us why you did choose that path and um, are you happy with it? Would you do it again? So please share your thoughts with us. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, as uh, Heike said, I am quite an old translator. If I look at the average age of people around me, I did my first paid translation in 1982 in the GDR on an ancient typewriter made my hands hurt for the first six weeks of my six-month job there. Um, and 
things have changed hugely during my career. Um, I went to study languages at university with no notion of what my career might be. I never even thought about it, to be honest. I went to study a subject I liked, and I was actually heard, I'm sure, to say numerous times, oh, I'll never be a translator, sort of thing. So I left university. I went uh, to work in various universities in France and Tunisia for five years. I did all sorts of different teaching and some TEFL teaching and different things. I came back to London to do a, an MA, which I never actually finished in the end. Um, and I got a job in an agency, not a very exemplary agency, may I say, to fund my studies. But I found, oh, I really like doing this work. So I thought, right, I'm going to have a go. I put up with it for one year. And, and then I just, I couldn't stand commuting. I couldn't stand working in an open plan office. I couldn't stand working for a boss who had no idea what translation was. So I went out on my own. Um, so, although I never set out to be a translator, I am now very pleased that I have been one for the last 35 years. Um, and I would certainly, certainly do it again. I did choose to be a freelance because it just suits my character. And I think that's a really important thing for young translators to think about. I mean, obviously, the difference between someone who was born in 1961 and someone who was born in 1991 is enormous in terms of expectations and working conditions, what sort of things are easy for younger people, things that I maybe find more difficult as an older person. Um, so I am very happy with my choice, but def definitely. I've never really worked I, worked... I started off working for agencies, some good, some bad. Um, I haven't really worked for agencies. I think at the moment I do about 2% of my turnover is for agencies, mainly small agencies run by other translators, and one client I've worked for for many, many years, who I do the occasional thing for. Um, that's just what suits me. I, that's the way I like to work. Um, and there's, but there are many roles for translators I've seen, and it's quite an eye-opener for me to come here and see so many people involved in sort of high-tech projects, which I don't know a lot about, because I work on small volume translations where I have a direct contact with my clients so I can phone them up and pester them and say, why have you said this? What do you mean? Is that really what you want to say? Etc. Less in law now. I do a lot of work in architecture. Um, and it's very interesting to see that there are some agencies which apparently you know, are really trying to look after their translators. Um, yeah, so... Yeah. Thank you. May I ask you a, qu a quick question, Terry, before we, we, mm -hmm. we just um, um, give, give the word to Alessandro? Um, Talking about attractiveness, I think we, the translation industry is one of the industries where you really can, you, you are able to work as a freelancer or self-employed. What, what are the, the most important aspects for you? Um, what, what kept you doing freelancing? So could you just give us, I don't know, two or three aspects which you love? Um, yeah. In, mm -hmm. in, in, your, in your freelance life. <laughs> okay. I suppose I'd divide them into two sort of groups. One would be um, professional advantages and the other would be personal. So for me, there's nothing better than to be able to speak to the person who wrote the text that I'm translating. And that probably, I can probably do that in about half of the jobs that I do. Um, so then I feel I can really understand, often beyond the words, what the, what the writer wants to say. Um, the others are off, they're more personal. They're, I, I'm not very good at working. I like to collaborate with other translators, and I always work with, a, with someone who revises my work, but I have difficulty with open plan offices where people are sort of chatting and not concentrating and spending eight hours doing four hours' work. I'd rather spend the other four hours doing something that I like doing. Um, yeah, and it's just generally, it's the independence you have, the independence to take responsibility for your work, the independence to stand up and say, this is my work, it's got my name on it. You know, if you've got a problem with it, come and tell me. It's the pro it's, I can start work at five in the morning or in the afternoon. I can, you know, I can work in my lovely office in my old pig shed in the southwest of France. Um, so I think, yeah. But I've, to be honest, I do think the most important thing is that I can talk to my clients. That's, that's the number one advantage I would say that I have. Thanks so much, Terry. Switching over now to, to Alessandro, and uh, the, the bridge will be, this is the name under my work, so this is quite an interesting one, especially if you look at the different, at, at the different job we have, jobs and volume streams in the market. So 
Alessandro Catalan is a COO at Translated in Rome. Um, Translated, your company, is one of the very modern emerging digital platforms. Your company is, I'd say, really one of the biggies, so you are very humble saying it's middle-sized, but it's a, it's, it, it, it's a very handsome size, I'd say. It. And uh, in your company, you were starting with a technical core, so it would, it's a company which, which said, yeah, tech first. But, uh, of course, you give jobs and work to um, an awful lot of freelancers, and you also have in-house staff. And I'd say in a model like you have it serving big international corporations, a freelancer won't be able to say, this is the name under my work, because it's a, it's a huge process. It's, you have so many team members involved. So... Um, yeah, would you be so kind and maybe elaborate a little bit on your model and, and how you collaborate with your freelancers and, and the working model as such? Sure, I'll try. <laughs> so, Translated is a tech company and is a translation company. We don't make a difference, though. We are not a tech-first company or a human-first company. Translated started in 1999, uh, was the first e-commerce platform for translation services in Italy where nobody actually used uh, the internet back then. So nobody would buy translations online. Nobody was looking for, hey, I need a translation. And in fact, the way it started was two founders. One, a very technical person, currently the CEO, Marco Trombetti, and uh, his wife, Isabel Andrieu, French linguist, they started a company with the two um, values, technology and humans. And at first, to get the clients, yes, they had the very shiny tech platform online, but how they did get the clients? Writing horoscopes. <laughs> so Isabel, the first thing she did was she started writing horoscopes because that was, was attracting uh, people to the website, and so maybe some, somebody would buy uh, the translations. After that, they created what today is called a social network, a forum, uh, where people would go there and chat about uh, whatever, and maybe somebody would buy a translation. It's always understanding what humans are looking for. So the human element, even though you're providing a technology service, is key. You need to reach the humans. Today, Translated is still based on technology, we develop CAD tools, we develop subtitling tools, dubbing tools, we develop machine translation, we are working now on large language models, but we have a very strong part that is based on what humans actually do. That's my part, so of course it's the best one in the company, but it's the operation side. There's many uh, transition companies that started in the past 10 years tech first. So they developed the best TMS, the best CAD tool, the best MT. I haven't seen one of them really succeed today because they lack the human element. The operations, if we want to call it technically, but really it's about the humans. And humans is the translators. On our platform today we have 400,000 translators registered with us. We work with anywhere between 5,000 to 10,000 freelancer on a yearly basis and we have a staff of 200 people half of them are linguists that do management work today half of them are engineers the opportunities are varied there's many opportunities for linguists I'm a linguist myself I started out as a translator then a project manager then vendor manager and then I went into operations the opportunities are many and you can go from translating, you know, one of the, the most interesting projects I managed when I was a project manager was translating a tattoo. You know, we have this e-commerce online, people go to our website and they place an order for whatever. We get translation requests for carpets. People buy carpets, maybe in Tibet or in the Middle East, and then they want to know what's written in there. And a tattoo is one that I got. So somebody sent a picture of their arm and said, hey, what, what did they write on me here, right? 
And that's one type of the jobs that you do. On the other hand, you have you know, the big digital companies in the US that you work for. You have very long programs running with them, worked for them for many years with hundreds of people involved in the process. And you kind of lose touch, as Heike was saying, of what you're saying. But really, if you're the, the best person in that job, you have the opportunity to scale up. And then, even when we work for Airbnb, for Airbnb is something I can share publicly, it's one of our main clients, and we have almost over a thousand translators working, linguists, a thousand linguists working on that account. Some of them started out translating the, the app. Nobody knows who they are. They don't have really an impact. But some of them scaled, and now are the key copywriters that work directly with the product teams, at Airbnb, designing the products that then they launch twice a year. It's the same that happened to me. I just decided that from a translation, I wanted to go into operations. Somebody from translation wanted to go into copywriting. Somebody might want to do uh, machine translation and so work on creating data. Uh, as I said, there are many opportunities. What is missing today and what will be less and less available in the future are mediocre jobs. So we do offer translation of tattoos, and that is something that really anybody can do. Somebody just wants to know what's written there. You can ask somebody on the street, really. <clears throat> then we do high quality jobs that only very skilled professionals like Terry might be able to do. The average translator or the mediocre translator, unfortunately, will only work on the tattoo. But now, that person will not ask me what's written on my arm because they have this. They take a picture and they get a translation. And the average translator, the mediocre, sorry, I'm being very straightforward here, but there are, unfortunately, the mediocre translators that really can only perform as good as machine translation or large language model. Uh, there's not the market for them anymore. At least, in the most common languages, at least in some domains, but really that is a market that is closed. That is closed, but there's so much, so many more opportunities, like we were saying earlier, literary translator, copywriting, uh, management, technology. So it's a market that is, to me, very attractive, just we need to understand that we need all to up our game, basically. Thank you so much, Alessandro. A quick question before we, we then switch to Marta. Uh, coming back to the, um, to the employment factor. Um, Terry said um, she, she really likes the idea of sitting in the driver's seat and, and just doing her own projects. Um, you employ um, yeah, a lot of staff internally, but also you give work to a lot of freelancers. Um, also staying with the aspect of attractiveness compared to being a freelancer serving end clients, where would you see the, the advantage of working for a big yeah, LSP um, or a platform like yours? So, so if you just could yeah, very shortly emphasize on that. Do you want to have mine? No, it is. Yeah. 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 Depends on how we define attractiveness, probably. So somebody might just be interested in a steady flow of work that guarantees a good enough uh, revenue. And so that's something that we can provide as agencies. Of course, you need to be a very good translator. You need to be the one that we always go to. If you want the relationship with the client, with an agency, is more difficult. We do have some roles for some clients that work directly with the clients. And so that is exciting when you have, when you start out as, a, as a, start out as a freelance translator and then you go to San Francisco to work with the product managers at Airbnb in designing the app. That's, to me, that's exciting, that's attractive. So it's a matter of what are you looking for. Uh, with an agency you get, you can get steady work, easy to get, it's more relaxed rather than going out and hunting for clients, I guess it's more difficult. And you can get opportunities in doing something that is also exciting, like working on very large projects that otherwise you wouldn't be able to touch. But at the same time, it can be alienating. So you yeah. can't just be one there sitting and just 
crunching words without really knowing why you're doing that. That to me was a bit frustrating when I was doing a tra uh, yeah. translation myself. Yeah. And so I wanted to do to improve, to actually get in the front seat and be yeah, able to, yeah, to actually drive yeah. the conversation. I understand. Thank you. I really like the, the idea of translating it to I can't get it out of my head, you know. It's just what, what is written on my arm when I came back from Las Vegas. Exactly. After <laughs> so, you did. so uh, yeah, I think this was quite a nice one. So... The audience, we will switch now to Marta, Marta Aragao, um, who started her business in a, I'd say, rather classical way, even if I can't yeah, judge Marta being classical. <laughs> you, uh, you always, I've been knowing you for long, you, you were always different, uh, you, had, you, you are full of bright ideas, you are tech savvy. Um, your business um, is located in the beautiful city of Faro. So, um, yes, could you please yeah, tell us what is, what is so important for you when it comes to employment, to work for LSPs? Um, yeah, rather not a platform model, but um, yes, please, can you give uh, a very clear message, especially to our young professionals who want to make a choice? Yeah. Yeah, uh, hi, good morning to all of you. So I have the job uh, to tell you about working in an LSP, uh, small, medium-sized, and w what does this mean? So I would start by saying that a little bit like Terry, I also studied translation. I didn't want to have a boss, but I could not stand work alone. So for me, that was the trigger. That was, that was the thing that made me start my own company. I was 21 years old, and I already was signing all the paperwork uh, to do it. So, first thing, it's about this. So, we move into companies when, in our profile, we are not the standalone person that is behind the computer. So, but I don't want to talk about this all the time, so I'll move to another question that is, so... Why are we talking uh, about our profession dying in translation and what's happening right now, when at the same time, companies are getting more global? So nowadays, globalization is something much bigger than it was before. So, and saying, by saying this, I'm not telling you that I'm not suffering right now. I had clients with big drops in, in, in jobs, so... I'm not saying that it's hard. Yes, it's hard, but are we dying or are we transforming? So maybe we are transforming, right? So just an, a different way uh, to see things. So I will start also with this word, flexibility. So for me, working as a group in a company means to be flexible. Sometimes I talk to my peer friends, and when they tell me that, ah, look, I have this translator or PM, and it, they only do what is written in the contract. And I just, I always think, thank God I'm Portuguese, because Portuguese people are used to do all sorts of things. Come on, they don't clean the floors, they don't do that kind of stuff, but they are flexible. So for now, for example, I also have uh, a marketing agency, communication. So, as you can see, I'm not so... I'm trained as a translator. Uh, I love languages, but I, I love everything that is new. So, I'm always setting up new businesses and projects, uh, and I push my people a little bit uh, to do that too. So, uh, if, if we think about this, what... And going back to the word flexibility, what do you think about a translator or a linguistic could be, because uh, I've heard some discussions about the, the terminology. Should we be called translators? Why are we discussing this? It's, for me, I'm sorry, and this is only my personal opinion, why aren't we looking into the future? Why can't we uh, combine that, for example, I can be a linguist translator, but I can also do marketing. I could be opening new markets for my clients. Or I can, and I refer to the awareness campaign with, uh, by the Lind Group here that is talking to the, to the, to the young people, teachers, and 
uh, to explain what this profession is about. So we should stop being so theoretical about it, so old-fashioned way, because young people don't want to hear this. They want to see all the possibilities they have. Maybe they can do translation in localized games. That's what they like. They can be international journalists and combine it with translation. So maybe we should look into all these endless uh, possibilities. So again, moving again. So what makes someone go and work for a company? Uh, career options, for example. Maybe you start as a translator, then you go and you are a proofreader or a project manager, or you go into management, or you go into specific uh, projects, or you just turn out to discover that you like marketing and you become kind of a marketing uh, language market analyst and you help clients localize into new markets. So this is one of the things. Some, I, I have some people in my team, and I know in other companies too, that suddenly they, they realize they like copy, and they started ad adapting into SEO, so, and language, and what I think is translators, we are really good with languages. We are, even I think we are the best prompters for ChatGPT, because we can really write in detail. We can give, some people ask me, how can you get out that out of ChatGPT and DALA? Maybe because I'm a translator, because I was trained with words. So I kind of get to write quite detailed prompts. So think about this too. So also continuous learning. People push people. So, and you learn all the time. You learn when you have that morning coffee with your colleagues. And some people, of course, it's up to each one's profile. Some people like to stay at home or work from, I don't know, China, Taiwan, and travel all the time. But others, they like to rely on peers. They like to rely on their teamwork members. They like to learn from the team and be pushed. And they also like to have a stable life. Some of them just value having a regular income or even do some extra work, but only when they want. They don't want to work the extra time or in the evenings and, or at night. So all, all these are factors and that influence someone to go uh, and work for a, an LSP or a company, whatever format it is. It's also about individual motivations and like uh, Alexander re referred. So what is the purpose of life for each one of you? What do you want to achieve? So sometimes uh, working for a company does not mean you cannot be an entrepreneur. It does not mean you cannot run a project or go the extra mile. Maybe you will have the support. I've seen that happen, so uh, it's not a problem. Also, if you care, if you have uh, the need to care for your peer colleagues or the culture of the company. So I would say, and I go back, be flexible. Flexibility is one of the most important things to help us move towards in this environment. So I think I made my case. <laughs> yes, uh, it was crystal clear. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Before I hand over to you, Gokhan, um, I'd also like to emphasize on that. I don't know if you all are aware of we are not just translators, we are service providers. And providing a service means, in most of the cases, working in teams. So, so what are the job models in translation companies? They really range from translators, revisers, um, to project managers, account managers, um, a huge, a huge part of, of um, of doing um, our job is communicating with clients. So it's really, it's, it's, it's very time consuming and, um, and then really track um, a translation process through from the beginning to the end is really a high quality job which has to be done by a team every single day. So, um, so it's really, it's really um, important to emphasize on that translation services are not just 
translation. And just to give you an outlook, we will give you um, as much room as we can for questions. So we, we, we will give you at least 15 to 20 minutes to ask your questions. Um, Maybe just before I hand over to Gurkhan, uh, and sorry, I forgot to, to, to order a, a Slido poll, but we could do it here with the audience who's here in person. Um, how many freelance translators do we have? Who is a freelance translator, could you? Wow, quite a lot. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is really good to see, fantastic. And who, um, who is part of, a, of an LSP, of a translation company? Yeah, quite a lot as well. So very good. So I, I look forward to, to very good questions. And um, yeah, now I'd like to hand over to Gökhan Firat. Um, Gökhan is a PhD student at the University of Surrey in Guildford and he looks deeply into working models in the, in the translation work um, but you also, if I got that right, you were involved in a lot of tech projects yeah? so you do a lot of research and um, would you be so kind to elaborate of what you found out about the working models we have in the market? I know that you emphasize on cooperatives, which is a very interesting one amongst freelancers. Um, yeah, but please go ahead and um, yeah. So looking forward to what you have to tell us. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Heike. <coughs> um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here with you. Uh, when, when we were preparing for this panel, and uh, we were discussing about bringing some elephants in the room, uh, which in our case is the AI, uh, neural machine translation, JGTP, and digital platforms, and of course, how they impact our profession and our industry. It is, as we have been discussing um, in this conference, uh, it is quite obvious that these technological developments are reshaping our industry and, uh, and also our profession uh, in both good and, and bad ways. Um, but is it really the technology itself that creates these problems? Is it the fault of the technology that we as translators are worrying about losing our jobs? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think technology is the real factor here. here. Technology is just another tool for translation, for communication, and we are not questioning. This is also a tool, and my hands are also a tool. We are not blaming the pen or my hands or my language that is trying to take my job. So, so what's the problem then? Um, I started looking at this in my profession. Also, I worked as a freelance translator, um, project manager in the industry, and now I'm doing my research on the topic. So. What I understood to really talk about the problem or, or this, this question, I would like to invite another elephant in the room so that we can really talk about the, the topic. And this elephant is usually it's quite big, but it's unnoticed, it's unmentioned, it's even censored intentionally or in, unintentionally. So the elephant that I would like to bring in the room is the profit-oriented structures and extractive business models of the companies, either the traditional ones or the platform ones. I know that some of you don't want to use the terms like capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, but not talking about them doesn't mean that they don't exist or, or they will just disappear. So they exist and they pretty much define every aspect of our lives, from the economy, culture, education, training, and of course our profession, it's not in isolation. So rather than attributing all our professions, problems, all our industry's problems, to some innocent elephants, to some technologies that would ideally make our lives and, and, and our communication systems more efficient, better, so I believe it's time to address the underlying issues that truly affect our profession and our industry. So my point here, and my, my main finding here, it's not the technology itself, or it's not the individuals. I know, that, I know lots of people who are, who are really good and doing their best, but what I'm trying to emphasize is this 5,000 years of structure, 
which is usually top to down in itself, and it is authoritarian because major decisions are, are usually made by a couple of people on the top, and these decisions have huge impacts on the working conditions and on the lives of the people who are doing our jobs, the, the jobs that we are talking, the translation. And also it's, it's also affecting how we use the technology. Technology doesn't have to be taking our jobs or, or making us in, 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 in precarious uh, positions. So my first finding and my starting point is that we should sh shift our focus from this cute elephant and confront the real challenge and the structural issues so that we can have a meaningful conversation about the attractiveness of the language industry. Otherwise, we will keep asking the same questions again and again, which have no clear, clear answers, and, and we will waste, for me, our valuable times, resources, and, and energy. So, uh, after this brief introduction, and so I can share some insights, maybe in the next round, about a global survey that I conducted as part of my research with 400 translators from 82 countries. So I'm, uh, I would like to also mention about this, maybe in, this, in the second round. Thank you so much, Gökhan. I think um, we could even already now open up the round for questions because otherwise we only will have, yeah, there will in the end only remaining five minutes for questions which I think would be a shame. So what I'm trying to do is relating the questions to your takes and maybe also to your, to your expertise. Um, I don't know, would, would the, the Slido panel be, be prepared to, to open for the questions or shall we just start with the, with the audience? Yes, why not? I, I, I'm I'm flexible. Yeah, thanks to uh, <laughs> the is what, what, thanks okay, to the Martha. Yeah. So sorry. actually, uh, first question. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, um, as I mentioned, it's a global survey with 400 translators from 82 countries from all continents, not only in the Europe. So many of these translators are freelancers, and and while the flexibility is a great advantage and great attractiveness for the translators, and the stability and the security of the income is not always there. About a third of them earn less than $500 in a month from translation work in general, which is the salvation line in many countries, and around two-thirds of them earn $1,500, which is the poverty line in many countries. And when we look at how much they earn only from the platforms, more than half of them, out of 400 people, reported an income of up to $500 per month, and 70% of them earn $1,000 from the platforms per month. And although they really work hard to earn that money, many of them, they, they, they face challenges rela related to inconsistent income, which comes with the freelancing job, and inadequate translation rates. Most of them, they complained about the competitive nature of the platforms because, as, uh, as Alessandro mentioned, there are lots of freelancers. On, like, on, on Translator, there are like 400,000 people. On Pros, there are 1 million. On SmartCat, there is five, 500,000 people. So they have to compete with each other and also with the machines. And they mentioned that this competition is leading to a reduction, a dramatic reduction in their rates. And 70% said that they there are no well-paying jobs on the platforms. And many of them, they work long hours, exiting mostly 48 hours. Uh, and also they have to be on call all the time. They work during the weekends, in evenings, and on holidays, and also after, after regular hours. And most of them, they also have uh, really um, problematic health, uh, health, unhealthy work and life balance. And of course, this impacts their health, so both physically and mentally. Many participants reported work-related stress, sleep issues, anxiety, and thoughts about suicide. 
So a great majority of them have neck and back pains, which I'm sure that many of you have as a freelancer or, or anyone who is working in front of a computer, vision disorders, and, and many more uh, health is issues. They usually don't have health insurance, and they don't have adequate savings for the, for the retirement. And almost all participants, they reported that they have no saying to improve their working conditions while working with the companies, either the platforms or the, or the companies. So why I'm telling this to you in a, in a panel titled Attractiveness of the, of the Language Industry, <laughs> I believe we need to really face the, the reality so that we can talk about the attractiveness of the, of, the, of the industry. I do believe that we need more people in our industry. There are lots of things to be translated. Many more than that we have, been translated, we have, we have translated. But if our structures and if our business models systematically undermine the value and the work of the translators, how can we talk about the attractiveness of the language industry? So, thank you. Yes, this is... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gökhan. This, this was really important. And, and just to tell the audience, I didn't know about the results of the, of the work and the survey. So it wasn't that I tried to suppress <laughs> that outcome. So please don't take me wrong. Uh, what I tried to do was to root maybe one or two questions toward Gökhan in order to, to, to present us um, the, the findings. Um, I mean, this is, um, this is a very good and I think a very difficult question to, to ask. Why do we talk about attractiveness um, if we have so many conditions in the market which aren't attractive at all? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, because... My, my spontaneous reaction was, but this is a very honest one and maybe a very blunt one, I was asking myself, why do these people do that? Because you don't have to. You mean work <laughs> in those conditions? Yeah, yeah. work, okay. yeah, yeah. So, so this, is, this was a very spontaneous reaction because it doesn't reflect my real reality. But, of course, I know that this reality exists. And, um, yeah, so maybe I would, I would give this question, and I think that's, that's a very relevant one, and, of course, I will also take your individual questions as well. But, um, Alessandro, I, I think you have to say something now <laughs> and tackle the, the elephant. <laughs> Oh, I was, uh, of course, what uh, Gokan said uh, makes a lot of sense, but it needs to be looked at from different perspectives. And if you look at it from an individual perspective or from what is talked about in society, you know, there are many jobs that have the same characteristics that uh, Gokan was saying, like uh, um, you cannot predict how much you are going to make this month or the next month. You cannot uh, afford to save money for health insurance or for retirement. One of them is YouTube creators. And yet everybody wants to be a YouTube creator, uh, which is totally idiotic in my opinion, but because the chances of making it as a creator are so slim that really most of the people will just not have money to, uh, to survive, basically. There are many jobs like that, jobs that people choose out of passion, as they say, or because they want a different lifestyle, a more flexible lifestyle. They want to work one day from Bali, the next day from uh, um, Rome or whatever. Uh, so it's a matter of decisions. Why do they choose to do that? And what I actually tell my team when they talk about work-life balance, which is another concept that came up, I actually had this conversation with uh, almost 10 of my project managers. It's if your idea of work-life balance is you work eight hours a day, so you get your salary, then you go home and you live, because that's your life, then whether you're working eight hours, six hours, four hours, two hours, you're just waiting, wasting your time. Don't do it. I mean, you have the option to always choose a different path. 
with a caveat. It's extremely difficult to achieve what you want. So if you want to work in this industry and you think that it is attractive for you, well, the truth is you have to work really hard to get where you want to be. Either be a very successful translator, you need to be highly specialized, you need to be the best, not in your class at school, university, the best on the market. And you can go out there and find your individual client and you can get paid good money. In my company, I have a lot of translators that earn as much as Gokhan was saying. Some of them, a thousand euros a year working for us. Maybe they work for other companies, maybe they have other jobs, I don't know. But I also have quite a few of them that make 80,000, 100,000, 150,000 a year just with us, which means probably they can work with other clients as well. What sets them apart? They work much harder, but they work much harder on the right things. And one of the things that was mentioning earlier when I made the joke about the horoscope is that the key element is understanding how you talk to humans, talk to other people, to reach the people that might be interested in what you're doing. So networking, getting out there and finding clients. I don't think that your clients just knocked on your door by hazard, right? Not many, right? Sorry, not many. Uh, it, the same happens for us. Unfortunately, as I was saying earlier, there's no room for mediocrity. You cannot just sit there and say, okay, I graduated in translation studies, please give me work because I'm a good translator. That's not how it worked 20 years ago and much less so today. You have to find out what really drives the market demand for what you're selling. Sometimes it's the quality of your job. Sometimes it's the fact that you're a nice person you send gift to project managers. <laughs> I, I, I really, yeah, I, I only can second you here. Uh, I think if you, if you opt for being a freelance translator, then you must understand that you will be running a business, your own business. You are an entrepreneur. And um, a lot of freelancers don't really get that. Huh? For example, I mean, I'm the moderator, so I don't, I won't talk about my company. But just an, ex yeah, something I realized throughout the years. Um, of course, we all, we also work with a lot of freelancers, translators, but. In all those years, and I have been running my company now for more than 25 years, only three freelance colleagues came to visit us in the office and invited themselves. Um, of course, we did organize events and they came, but only three of them in all those years offered, listen, um, I want you to be my client um, and I would like to come and see how you work. So we also should describe that a translation agency, how we call it, is a proper company. And, um, and it functions like a proper company. And we also want to be clients to our freelancers because we all have to deliver a top-notch service to our clients. So, um, yes, but now we have um, my concept of giving you the floor for very, very urgent questions didn't work so well. We have 10 minutes to go, and I would like to take questions. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Clara, and I'm here with the University of Osijek, and my question is for Alessandro. So you mentioned uh, humans at the forefront. So in no uncertain terms, how does translated put humans first? So if you could please give some concrete examples besides communication with it intent, I guess. Thank you. So you mean about uh, the roles or the training that we provide or... Uh... Um, let's just keep it, I guess, with freelancers. Maybe that, would, uh, that part would be uh, more um, relevant for this group. Okay. So... Freelancer, when, when I started at a company 16 years ago, the only freelance job that we were offering was translation. So, in fact, we had a, a portal where people would register themselves. It was called Translator Online Profile. 
you would go there and fill out your information and maybe get some uh, job offers from us. That evolved over time because of the growth of the market that Marta and Heike were talking about, because of the different offerings that we put on the market, that has grown over time. And today, Translation is still a part of that, but that TOP, Translator Online Profile, today is Talent Online Profile. Because we're looking for translators, we're looking for uh, copywriters, we're looking for subtitlers, and we're looking for this name is not mine, but I'll use it as the marketing team created it, transdubbers, which is something entirely new. <laughs> it's an awful word, but I'll explain. We created a tool that allows subtitlers to actually dub a video with synthetic voices. Okay, so basically you do the subtitling, do the adaptation, then you generate the voice, you adapt the voice, you do some tricks, on the phonetics, etc., to create great voices. That is something that we created because we created the tool, we created the profession, we are creating the training for people to learn how to do that. Then, of course, we've been using machine translation since 2004. Our first project in machine translation with the European Commission are back in 2004. Today, machine translation is the basis of all of our translations. So if you work with us as a translator, in fact, you're doing post-editing, as we were saying earlier. Post-editing can be an, an extremely ugly job, you know, when you're just confirming what the machine is saying, or it can be creative, where basically what you're doing is you're taking that text and bringing it to the level of the copywriting. So basically it's uh, uh, copy editors or trans creators, even though I agree, it's not a great term, it's just a matter of positioning, it's marketing. These, num these names are just marketing. But basically, the opportunities that we offer are, of course, translation, post-editing, subtitling, transdubbing, uh, copywriting, language expert for our clients, so the ones that I was describing earlier, that they go and work with the product teams of the companies to help drive how those products are developed for their markets. And then, of course, everything that has to do with in-house positions, that it's another world and it's quite uh, wide. I hope I replied. Yeah. No? Thank, thank you, Alessandro. Yeah. Was the question answered? Um, She's laughing, so maybe no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as far as I could figure out, uh, or as I could understand you, um, are you saying that by developing tools for the uh, freelancers that you are onboarding, that's how you are putting the human first, like at the forefront? It, at least that's how I... So I was focusing on the opportunities that we created because the market growth combined with how much more market shares we got in the market, thanks to the technology and investments, has allowed us to offer a lot more opportunities to the freelancers. That is in terms of what we offer. Going back to the technology, the technology that we develop is CAD tools, so something that you all use, machine translation that allows people to do post-editing, hopefully a little better, <laughs> since ours it's adaptive and blah, 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 blah. And then the subtitling and dubbing tools that, again, are other platforms that you can use when you work for translated or you can use on your own for your business, but it's tools that allow you to be I don't know, more productive or any way to have another way of line of work. Thank you, Alessandro. Before we take the last question, or maybe one or two, if we if we can be quick, I'd like to to emphasize on one thing. If if you if you feel like you have silent questions which you don't like to ask now, as we have a lot of associations representatives here. Um, so I'm a voluntary worker myself at the EUATC, which is an umbrella organization for national associations of LSPs. We have John O'Shea here, who is um, the chairman of Fit Europe, um, the umbrella organization of freelance um, associations in, in, in the European countries. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to a survey we are going to run uh, starting in January. You will find a roll-up 
here in in the in in the lobby please uh, scan the qr code and make your voice heard it would be great if we had more freelancers and uh, even more young professionals participating in that survey because whatever you you yeah you you ask from us or or what what is your opinion on which topic will be heard and we need that fee feedback in order to work on that in the associations so i don't want to forget to mention that um, and also the already mentioned awareness campaign for the whole translation industry, which we need. We, we, we will be facing a talent crunch, so um, the translation industry won't go down. Uh, we will be looking for talents in, in, in the various job profiles. So please also yeah, participate in that campaign, which will be launched after TEF. And now, three minutes to go. One very last question, if you have one. Yes, please. Um, thank you for this presentation. And I would like to ask, uh, actually, to everyone, because uh, it implies on uh, every title. OK, so for new beginners, being a freelancer is really scary because of the need for validation and getting a decent payment uh, while uh, getting the financial rights being uh, protected and uh, preserved and uh, I would like to ask um, so uh, what would you advise to new beginners to us who is the validation and also a flexibility uh, in the working environment or time frame so th these are really uh, two concepts that are against each other but I wanted to know thank you Thank you so much. Um, a c very quick answer from myself. Um, you always can contact your associations. So it's not just a dumb bunch of people not knowing what to do. Yeah? They can give you advice and they very often also have mentoring programs. So here you get, usually you get a lot of information out there. But then of course, I don't know, Marta, do you have an idea? Uh, do you want to give an advice? Huh? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. First thing, of course, associations and groups. Because as a freelancer, if you fall out of a group, like because of validation, that's why some people choose to be in-house. Uh, if you choose to be a freelancer, uh, you need to create a support net. You need to have peers you talk to. Uh, and another thing is uh, going to it in a different scope. For example, even the LSPs. For example, in my case, just an, ex an idea. Uh, because I have the communication and marketing agency at the same time, uh, I had some translators coming to talk to me and asking me, what skills do you think uh, I need uh, to do different kind of jobs? So they want to get rid of the paperwork uh, job that is translation in, in its pure uh, way. And because if suddenly they are producing content or adapting, localizing content for ad campaigns, for example, they need to understand the market and we, you cannot put a price tag on that. It's not uh, powered. So talk to people. It's always behind every company name there are people. Talk to the people. So that would be my advice. Yeah. Thank you so much. So yeah. we, yeah. yeah. I just very want to say yeah. very yeah. briefly, as I, saw, I started with no experience as a translator, and I got some experience, you need to pay attention to three things. If you want to be a successful translator, you must specialize. You must be able to talk to your clients using the language they use to talk about their profession every day. So you need to not just be a member of the ITI or the SFT or whatever. You need to be a member of the RIBA if you work in architecture. You need to work find the equivalent in your professional area. Secondly, you need support. You need to work partly with the, with the, the association that mentioned. You need to form your own groups. You need to look at who you graduated with, how you can help each other. Find a translator who's going to mentor you. ITI, for example, offers a mentoring service, if you work in English, that is obviously. The third thing is, I would say, is style. You need to spend just as much, if not more time, working on your target language. It's always easier to find someone who can tell you what something means. It's much more difficult to have the discipline to look at yourself and be really critical of your work. So you need to read 
the sort of text that you're looking to produce in your language. And finally, translators need to stand up, be counted, not hide behind a pile of books somewhere in a, in a dusty office. They need to stand up. If we want to be regarded as professionals, we have to be able to stand shoulder to shoulder with a lawyer, with a doctor, with an architect, with an engineer. Not when you're 21 and you've just graduated, I grant you. But you have to work towards that. You just have to stand up and be counted and take responsibility for your career. Because it's not Alessandro's fault if he could offer... What, that's what his company does. It offers what it does. There's no... He hasn't got to give people jobs. We have to get off our backsides and look after and look out for ourselves. Okay. <clears throat> I think this was a very good closing speech. Uh, now we have the conflict between coffee and more questions. Mm -hmm. I would propose the following because uh, can you confirm that we can answer the questions later on just online? We, we, I mean, we, we have access to Slido and, and can answer the questions. So maybe we will do that in, in, in the course of the afternoon. And um, because I don't want to compromise our conference organizers and just ruin, ruin the time, the timetable and the coffee breaks. Huh? Mm -hmm. So um, maybe if, if, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So I, I think there would be room for, <laughs> for a lot of more questions. Maybe we will have a follow up somewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much for your interest. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, not least for bringing elephants into the room. Though those are very, very much welcome, and uh, we hope that this will lead to uh, everybody here and out online as well feeling represented and getting food for thought to discuss more. Anyway, from practicalities from Micha. See you back at noon. Thank yes. you. Have a good break. <laughs>